years ago, and it sounds actually really quite progressive. So um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're ahead of the curve. You're ahead of the curve. Road building alone cannot relieve congestion, so it is essential that walking, cycling, and public transport routes be improved. As well as promoting healthier lifestyles, this will e help to ease the traffic problems within the city. Anything that encourages people to make use of more sustainable forms of transport, such as making public transport tickets easier to buy and use, and equipping transport hubs with better information, should be encouraged. Splendid. Bravo. <laughs> Over to you, sir. <laughs> Gosh, thank you very much. I'm going to abuse the... that. I will. I'm just going to abuse the floor very much by taking a selfie of myself in front of all of you. So, to say thank you so much for this marvellous occasion. Um, I first saw that done when I was interviewing um, uh, the Freakonomics guys um, at the Hay Festival. And, and Steve Levitt just came straight out and went like that in front of 2,000 people. I thought that's a very impressive trick. I should definitely try to eat that. Um, well, Jeremy, thank you. The romantic letters of mine that you could have quoted in a much more embarrassing way um, than that one. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Uh, and thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, indeed, for coming. I should uh, explain that I am just a kind of um, morsel compared to the smallest board of joy you're going to have with John Whiteley uh, later on. But perhaps I can talk a little bit from the government side of things, as was. Of course, I've now, to my immense chagrin, been taken out of the Department of Transport just when we started to make some real progress. Um, which is driving me nuts, but uh, there are still one or two things I hope we can do. Um, that's the bad news, you've, you've lost a son, but you haven't in a sense gained a daughter because I'm now the Treasury, and so I'll be looking to try to preserve all of the kind of spending ideas that we were working at on uh, in the department uh, in my new job. Do come and sit down, there are, there are several chairs at the front, if you would like. Gosh. Tracy and John, lovely to see you, welcome both. Sorry, Sorry. 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 <laughs> Um, so, so I thought what I might do was just to kind of lay out a landscape for you of things that um, I've been working on and things the government is interested in, and then try to use that as the background, uh, or, or as a provocation, to questions you might have, and then we can, as it were, explore some of these issues further on. Um, I think we're, uh, 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 you know, I think we're in the early stages of something that we should have been in the early stages of five or ten or maybe even fifteen years ago, which is a complete transformation of our transport uh, system to make it much more sustainable, much greener, and, and frankly much more active. Uh, there is now an enormous body of uh, information that doesn't really point to the problems of particulate matter and air quality, nitrous oxide and the rest, um, but to the health benefits of active travel. And of course we know that from a green standpoint, public transport um, is almost invariably uh, one of the uh, least um, heavily impacting modes of transport. Uh, and uh, when I came into the Department of Transport, which was a couple of years ago, uh, I found a department that was fantastically expert in its area. In fact, in many ways, set a benchmark for expertise across government. It's not, people don't think of this in terms of transport, um, uh, but I think transport is one of the best departments in government, and it's filled with people who really know what they're talking about. Um, you know, who have 20 or 30 years of experience. If you want to know something about street furniture, if you want to know something about traffic signs, if you want to know roads, road safety, you have tremendous expertise in that department. Um, but of course, like all government departments, it's also structured around priorities and, um, as it were, a certain momentum, which uh, has taken it in directions. And of course, that momentum is heavily generated by the nature of our democracy. And the nature of our democracy is that we abhor spending money without proper processes of accountability. And so the Department of Transport historically has been set up in ways that respects that. That is to say, it thinks about roads and rail and um, air transport and passenger transport by air, uh, and of course also maritime. And it treats this in a very mode-specific way. Uh, and that um, very much has shaped the nature of our transport uh, in this country over the last a few years. And it reflects um, priorities that have been set democratically by successive governments uh, and by the nature of the bureaucratic machine itself. Now what is fascinating is that, um, not before time, an awful lot of that is changing. We're now moving to much more of a place-based system of thinking about transport. Um, we've now begun to catch up with, come on in, see, 
Um, um, uh, we've now begun to catch up in our thinking with some of the best continental models, and I don't need to tell you, um, go to Holland, go to Amsterdam, go to Copenhagen, go to Seville for cycling, a city that's been completely transformed by high energy uh, initiatives uh, in cycling, uh, and as I have done, go to Besançon or Lyon for public transport, for light rail, and you will see some of the fantastic examples of how transport can be done uh, and integrated better than we're doing it uh, in this country. Uh, and the government's tried to respond to that in different ways. So one of them is this thing called the Transforming Cities Fund, 1.6 billion quid. We've just given um, 320 million of that. This goes to the biggest cities in the country, top 12 conurbations. Uh, and we've just given, for example, Manchester, uh, 320 million quid. Something like 160 of that goes to my friend Chris Boardman and Brian Deegan to work on a potentially transformative um, uh, a remodeling of the uh, centre of Manchester in favour of cycling and walking. And walking cycling always go together um, because there's so much overlap in the kinds of infrastructure you want to see there. Now, in the last nine years, I'm pleased to tell you, um, uh, uh, cycling in particular uh, spend has gone up massively. When um, uh, the present well, last one government came to, uh, uh, came to power in 2010, cycling spend was about £3, well, £2.50. Um, ahead, it's now a bit over seven, um, and if my uh, spending review bids are followed up by my uh, successor, we will be more like 15 by pounds per head by 2022. Now, the best continental models are at 30 to 35 pounds a head per year of spend, so we're still some way to go, but it's a heck of a lot better than it was, and it's heading in the right direction. So, you've got that place-based aspect. The government's now trying to expand on that. Uh, in a couple of different ways. There's a thing called the Future High Streets Fund, which is about restoring high streets that may have been blighted by um, the internet or by other change, uh, uh, absentee landlords. Am I ringing any bells here, ladies and gentlemen, in Hereford? Um, uh, and also, of course, uh, a thing called the Stronger Towns Fund, which is about towns that have been left behind uh, in uh, this country, and many of them, coastal towns, um, many other communities. Uh, Hereford, I don't think, is going to qualify like that, uh, because contrary to the worries that we have about empty shops, um, you know, if you look around the country, there are a lot of towns in worse position than this one, and that's really where that's aiming. But that's, it, these are early days, and what I have been arguing for is a transformation in transport policy that takes this process of change, accelerates it uh, radically in a much more sustainable and green uh, and inclusive direction. So what would that include? Well, two or three different elements. One is a big tilt towards active travel, the kind I've talked about already. So walking and cycling, and of course, uh, um, all of the health benefits that go from that. We now know that um, that's uh, some of the healthiest. It's not just healthy, incredibly good for you. It's incredibly good for the environment. It's incredibly good for communities. It promotes inclusivity, although there are many areas in which we can reach out to communities further to promote cycling and walking. Uh, it's incredibly good for high streets. So if you look at something like the mini Holland schemes they've done in the Waltham Forest and uh, around uh, 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 various urban areas in the country, many of them in London, you will see um, uh, that not just that walking goes up hugely, cycling improves, uh, but also there's a pickup in local custom and um, shopping as well. So it's just good all round, and that's why active travel is a really central part of uh, change. I think we also need to think about, and I have been personally involved in thinking about, several other aspects. One is light rail. By light rail, I don't mean heavy light rail. That is to say, trams of the kind that you would see in Nottingham or Birmingham. We've just extended, we've just given funding, you will see in Birmingham to extend the tram link down to uh, Briarley Hill. Um, but I don't mean that. I mean ultra light. I mean things like the Stour Bridge link. And Stour, what is so fantastic about Stour Bridge? Um, if you are a, a very, uh, as it were, interested in the same which I am, um, is that the technology for that is astonishingly simple. It's an auto engine, it's a two litre auto engine with a large flywheel. That's literally what it is in a, in a rig. You fire up the flywheel, you get the thing moving, and it isn't fully sustainable, it's, a, it's a not electric, uh, it's a diesel uh, uh, rig, but it is fantastically good in terms of being able to transport 60, 90 people short distances. And the question I've raised through asking for a call for evidence around the country is whether we couldn't use ultra light rail systems and modern technology drastically to lower the cost of providing these very green sustainable modes of transport and then open up all these cities and in particular 
medieval cities such as ours, where some of these corners are pretty tight, you can't take an enormous heavy rail system around them, and see if there isn't scope to do that. And, and I think um, if we can get the cost down, that could not just be very exciting from a local standpoint, it also could be the basis of an industrial strategy, creating light rail options that could be sold around the world. That's the kind of, uh, as it were, strategic vision I think should be put behind that. Uh, what else? So two or three other key things. One of them is electric vehicles. I don't need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that um, electrification is occurring um, throughout transport at the moment. Uh, in my area, that's meant enormous amounts of support for electric vehicles. Uh, at the moment, we have tremendous supply constraints. If you order an electric vehicle now, you won't expect it to be delivered for 9 or 12 months. Um, but as the supply side, as the manufacturers are really gearing up, you will start to see an astonishing profusion of new electric cars coming forward. Uh, that hopefully will, will, will reduce prices, um, um, but it will also extend ranges and create many more options for people. I'm incredibly excited about that because at the moment people have natural worries about electric cars. The fact that 98% of journeys are under 50 miles somehow doesn't register um, because one always thinks about what was going on. And also no one takes a 500 mile drive without a pee in the middle. Um, so it's not as though, as it were, your, your uh, uh, hydrocarbon alternative is exactly unproblematic. But that is a very, very interesting thing. As we see more uh, 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 innovation in that area, I think electric cars will go into, I think it's pretty obvious, a fantastic S-curve. And the question is, how quickly can you get that rapid iPhone-type take-up? Uh, and how can we spread that along? And the government set a, an agenda, a, 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 an aspiration of 2040 for all new cars to be effectively zero emission. Um, and 2050 for all hydrocarbon cars or virtually all to be off the roads. Uh, now, those may not feel like a very large ambition, but let me tell you, um, given the relatively small number of electric cars, the rapid escalation in them, but the fact that we have 34 odd million hydrocarbon cars on the road, we can't get rid of them too fast. I'm and what I mean by that is we need to get rid of them as fast as we possibly can, but we also have to do it in a way that um, is uh, 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 realistic given the supply constraints and given the potentially regressive costs imposed on people. If you forced everyone into an electric car in five years' time, you, what you're essentially doing is writing off the existing mode of transport of 95% of the population at huge potential cost. So there is a, there's a genuine issue that we can discuss whether that process can be brought forward, and I'd be uh, interested to do that, and of course we can. What we've set at the moment is just a target. It would be fantastic if that S-curve becomes steep, steeper and sharper, and we can bring that target forward. That's one aspect. Micro-mobility is another. Electrification is also hitting small uh, um, uh, modes of transport, like um, you may have seen these skateboards in cities, electric skateboards, or uh, you may have seen um, these scooters, of course. Um, and what I've done there, what I did there, at least I should say my last tragedy, my last job now <laughs> left, um, is to have a micro-mobility review that allows us to think about some quite knotty issues about how these things should be introduced, if necessary, if at all, and how uh, they could be, if not licensed, then made safe, the safety regime that goes with them, uh, and the like. And there have been cities, and Austin, Texas is one, in where these things have proliferated, and there's been a very serious safety concern. So that's a, it's a well-motivated worry. Uh, of course, if you think about electrification, you can't not mention e-bikes. E-bikes are incredibly useful. I think everyone should have an e-bike. It's revolutionized my life having one for going longer distances. It's fantastic if you're older. It's fantastic if you have a disability. Um, people take more exercise on an e-bike than they do on a regular one because they don't worry about distance or hills. Uh, and um, the prices are falling very, very quickly. One of the things I was able to do was to create a fund to support e-cargo bikes as a way of getting white diesel vans off the roads and out of inner cities, and I very much hope that pedicabs and pedicargo, my friend Will Vaughan, will be applying for that if he hasn't already for some of his next generation uh, fleet of, of e-bikes. So that's that. Let me say one final thing, which is uh, autonomous vehicles, and then I'll shut up and take any questions you've got. Um, autonomous vehicles are the source of probably more discussion in this world of uh, transport than you could possibly imagine. An awful lot is, uh, of that is overblown. Um, you are seeing Teslas, you're seeing other cars which have aspects of self-driving, lane-hugging, separation uh, in there. We are, in my judgment at least, quite a long way before there is any uh, commercial uh, automotive vehicle uh, option going to be available. Um, I think uh, when it comes, it will come very quickly. It raises all kinds of interesting philosophical and safety issues which we can discuss, issues of public accountability which we can discuss. Um, but what is fascinating is the, is, is the prize that that offers if one could make it work. 
inevitably, I think originally, I mean, in the first place in cities, it'll be a long time before it comes to a county such as ours, um, but still worth playing for. What is that prize? The prize is that nearly 1,800 people are killed a year on our roads, and we call them accidents, but one of the things that I've been pushing the department towards is a much more safe systems type approach towards road safety, where you think of the entire road environment as something that's potentially uh, liable to create an accident. And uh, or, or, or an injury or fatality or uh, uh, some kind of other um, uh, health issue. So you have a situation with uh, autonomous vehicles where the potential in due course, maybe 10, 20, maybe longer number of years, would be to, to, to reduce that number dramatically. And if you look at what industrial automation has done in terms of reducing the failure rate in certain areas, and if you look of, of industry, and if you look at the way in which the aircraft industry, by using a safe systems approach, has virtually engineered um, passenger death out, with a few uh, signal recent exceptions, as you'll be aware of these um, 77 maxes, um, then that is a fantastic prize worth playing for. And of course, with those 1,800 um, deaths comes uh, you know, untold tens of thousands of injuries and terrible suffering for families uh, and individuals. So that is a brief snapshot of the work I've been involved in. I think there's a colossal opportunity here for Hereford and Ross and the market towns of the county uh, and more generally to try to um, take advantage of that. One of my uh, bequests to my successor is um, an argument that we should increase our local road settlement by 25 to 50 percent with transparent five-year funding including structures um, which would be a massive boost to our, our, our road system. Don't forget, before one worries about roads, I haven't talked about highways in yet, even strategic roads, talk about that, but uh, in the questions. But local roads are often themselves um, the cause of accidents, of um, loss of value. It is regressive because if you are someone who doesn't have much money in the bank and you run over and you lose a wheel or you lose an axle, that can potentially take you out altogether. We live in a very rural county. It's essential that our roads should be properly maintained. I'm very pleased to see Clive Hall here and others because um, they do a fantastic job. And my officials in the Department of Transport recognize what a great job they do. And we would certainly greatly benefit. I think between that, between the money I've talked about placemaking, about the possibility of cycling and walking, about the possibilities for light rail, about the possibilities more general for electrification and micromobility. There is a tremendous future ahead uh, for us in Herefordshire, and I very much hope we will be able to take it collectively by an act of imaginative um, uh, projection as to where we could be, because it will be nothing but good for our economy, it will be nothing but good for the well-being and health of our citizens, and it will be nothing but good for the environment uh, as well. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, from wherever I am, DFT, Treasury, all the backbenches, I will be giving it my absolutely full throated support. Thank you very much indeed.